A lot of people think calculus is hard, but it's actually so easy that a 5th grader can understand. Calculus is mainly about two things, how things change in moments of time, and finding the area and volume of very weird objects. Let's start with a flat square, that is 3 spaces tall and 3 spaces wide. If you count up all the spaces, you get 9. But what would happen if you add one more row and one more column? Now it becomes a 4x4 square, totaling 16 spaces. But how much did you add to the 3x3 to get the 4x4? Well if you count them, you get 7. You change the square by adding 7 spaces. That 7 you added is called your rate of change. For now, you can think of rate of change as how much does it take to get from one number to another number. In our example, we grew the square from 9 spaces to 16 spaces. However, rate of change applies to things that are continually growing. Let's take a better example. Let's say you want to be a YouTuber. So you make your channel, you upload some content, and in your first 10 days, you've grown by 10 subscribers. Let's make a graph to show this. In this graph, it shows how many days have passed versus how many subscribers were gained. So what's the average rate of change from day 0 to day 10? Let's pick two points. 10 10, 10 and 0, 0. If you take how much you go up, which is 10, divided by how much you go across, which is 10, the answer is 1. So your average rate of change was 1 subscriber a day. This even works if you take day 7 and day 3. You take the higher most point and you subtract it by the lower most point. Take the second part and subtract them and put them on top, and the first part, subtract them and put them on the bottom. And if you work out the math, you still get 1. You grow by 1 subscriber a day. In calculus, rate of change is represented by this triangle called a delta. Delta just means change. In our previous example, you can write the 7 that the box changed by as delta 7. As you might also notice, the rate of change is also the slope of the line. You get this by taking the rise over run and putting them in this formula. I know these are letters, but don't be nervous. The y's just means the second parts of the points I gave you before, and the x's are the first part. You then subtract them and divide. See? No big deal. Getting the rate of change was easy when your graph looks like this. However, what if your subscriber growth looked like this? In real life, things don't always grow at a constant rate. They sometimes speed up or slow down at different points in time. And what if you wanted to find the rate of change not over a long period of time, but a snapshot? shot in time. If you drop a ball, it doesn't fall at a constant speed, it accelerates over time. Let's make a graph for the falling ball that looks like this. The horizontal line down here is called the x-axis, and the vertical line here is the y-axis, and points on the graph are represented as x and y. So if we put point 2, 4, 2 is the x-coordinate, and 4 is the y-coordinate. The x and y's are called variables, which are placeholders for numbers. We use this when we don't know what number we're going to put in yet, but the good thing is we can still do math with them. We're going to be using these terms x and y from now on. So, how would you find the rate of change from 1 second to 2 seconds. Just like we did before, we find the rise over run and calculate using the formula. Although this graph is curved, so let's draw a line through these two points. This line is called the secant line. Anyway, when we calculate using the formula, we get 3. 3 is the average rate of change between 1 second and 2 seconds. And again, this is also the slope of the line. But what if you wanted to find the rate of change at exactly 1 second? Well, we know the change between 1 and 2. Maybe picking a number closer to 1 will give us a better idea. Okay, that's a decent answer, but can we do better? Sure. What about 1.2 or 1.1 or 1.01? or 1.001. It seems, as the x-coordinate goes closer to 1, the slope of the line becomes closer and closer to 2. And if you try this on the other side, from 0 to 1 second, the same thing happens. In fact, we can go so small that the slope of the line starts becoming exactly 2. So at point 1, 1, the instant rate of change is 2. That's the slope of this line right here, which is called the tangent line, because it touches the graph at only this one point. And here we have one of the most fundamental concepts in calculus, the derivative. When we took two points, or when we grew our square, we found the average rate of change. But what we just found, which is the derivative, is the instantaneous rate of change. So when you drop the ball, at exactly one second, the instantaneous rate of change at that exact frame of time is 2. We use delta to write the average rate of change, but to write the derivative, we use this notation. Although it's sometimes written like this. If you look at it closely, it kind of looks like our slope formula, because these are both the exact same thing. We found the average speed of our ball between 1 and 2 seconds, which is 3, but the speed of the ball at exactly one second is 2. But what's the formula to find the speed? Well, it's distance over time. Or in terms of this graph, rise over run. Yeah, you can think of speed as a derivative. It's actually a derivative of position. And we tracked it all through this graph. See? That wasn't hard. Now this line graph here is called a function. A function is a way that you find points on a graph. It usually takes an x value as an input and gives you a y value as an output. Basically, what do you have to do to x to get y? Functions are written like this and are pronounced f of x. So our graph was f of x equals x squared, which means in order to get the y value, we have to take the x value and square it. Not all graphs are functions though. They usually have to pass something called the vertical line test, which means if you pass a vertical line through the graph, it can only intersect at one point. I told you before that derivatives are written like this, but sometimes they're written like this. This comma looking thing is called the prime, and you pronounce this as f prime of x. In our example, we move the secant line closer and closer to 1 to find the derivative. This process is called finding the limit of a function. It's written like this. This just means if an x value of one point gets closer and closer to the 
the x value of another point, then what happens to the slope of our secant line? Now before, to find that answer, we did it manually, but you can actually just find it by plugging the numbers into a formula. It looks like this. Now normally, you plug your function into this formula and do a bunch of math to find a derivative, but there is an even easier method to find a derivative than any of the ways I showed you. If you have a function that looks like this, this is what you have to do. Anytime you see a number by itself, no matter what it is, boom, gone, just get rid of it. Anytime you see a number attached to a variable, just drop the variable. If you see a number attached to a variable attached to an exponent, you carry the exponent to the front, multiply it by the number in front, then you reduce the exponent by one, and boom, there you go. It's literally that easy. What's the derivative of this function? Boom. What's the derivative of this one? Boom. And this one? Boom. Piece of cake. So what was the derivative of our function x squared? Well, you just move the two in front, then drop the exponent by one. Anything to the first power is itself, so we don't have to worry about that. Remember what our x value was at one second? Well, one. And one times two is two. Hey, that's the derivative we found before. It was always this easy. The derivative, the limit as that gets to one, the slope of the tangent line, instantaneous rate of change, it's all the same thing. This nifty trick will help you find the derivative of many functions. Although it's not the only one, there are many other rules to do this. Because sometimes functions will look like this, and you need other techniques to find the derivative. But what I just taught you should help you a lot. Now you're probably thinking, if I don't major in math or physics, why would I ever need derivatives? Well, here's a way to use derivatives that anyone can find useful. Making money. Let's say you were to start a lemonade stand. You want to set the price of the lemonade to maximize the amount of money that you'll bring in. Set the price too low, you'll get more sales but less money. Set the price too high, you'll get less sales and less money. So what's the most optimal price to sell your lemonade so you can maximize sales and income? Let's represent this with a graph. This shows the price versus the amount of sales. On the left side here, the tangent line slopes upward, and on the right side, the tangent line slopes downward. But what would happen if you put the tangent line right at the peak? The tangent line is completely flat. The function is represented by this equation. One thing to note about line graphs are, when they go upward from left to right, the slope is positive. When they go downward from left to right, the slope is negative. But whenever a line is completely flat on the graph, its slope is always zero. But how can we use this to set the maximum price we could on our lemonade? Well, we find a derivative. You should know how to do this by now. Put the exponent in front, drop it by one, and on this side, get rid of the variable. And there we go, that's our derivative. And since we know our slope right here is zero, we know that this whole derivative is equal to zero. Then you solve the equation by getting p by itself, and doing the math, we get three. There we go, the maximum price that we can set our lemonade without losing any sales or money is three dollars. Although it doesn't look like it yet, we have a problem here. This technique works for finding the maximum point of any graph, but it also works for finding the minimum as well. And in our calculation, if we confuse the maximum for the minimum, we could be in big trouble. And if we didn't have a graph to work with, we wouldn't know if it was a max or min at all. So what's the solution? Now let's introduce the second derivative. What's a second derivative? Well, it's a derivative of the derivative. Remember how we found the derivative of the first equation? Well, just do it again. Now just drop the variable and also drop the number as well. And there's our second derivative, negative two. When finding the minimum and maximum of a graph, if your second derivative is a number greater than zero, it's a minimum. But if your second derivative is a number less than zero, like a negative number, it's a maximum. If it's zero, then it's neither. Because like I said, that would be a completely flat line. There you go. We found multiple derivatives and we were able to maximize sales. Remember our falling ball example from earlier? We found the speed of the ball, which is a derivative of position. Well, when a ball accelerates, that's a derivative of speed. Acceleration is the second derivative to position. Now you're probably wondering, is there such thing as a third derivative? Well, actually, yes. You can have a fourth derivative, or a fifth, or a sixth, or even more than that. You write the second derivative like this, but you don't write them for the third derivatives onwards. Third derivatives and beyond, or higher order derivatives, are written like this. By the way, the derivative of acceleration is a jerk. When a ball is in free fall, we know its position is changing, we know that it's speeding up and accelerating, but if all of a sudden, a gust of wind were to encounter the ball before it hit the ground, it would cause a change in acceleration, thus a slight jerking motion. Funny enough, the higher order derivatives of that are called snap, crackle, pop. Remember what I said earlier? That calculus is also about finding the area of very weird shapes. You probably know how to find the area of normal geometric shapes, but what about the area of this? This may look troubling at first, but if you cut the shape right here, thus creating two rectangles, the area then becomes easy to find. What about the area of this shape? Again, you just cut it into rectangles and then find the area. You probably know how to find the area of these shapes because you've been given a formula that you just plug the numbers into. But what about finding the area of a shape like this or this? Sadly, there's no default formula for finding the area of shapes like this, so we'll just have to make one ourselves, and that's what calculus is for. We know how to find the area of a rectangle, it's the length times width. This shape may look daunting, but let's see if we can get rectangles to match the shape. We won't get the exact right answer, but we'll be somewhere in the ballpark. The line function here is x squared like before, and the point right here is 1, 1. So horizontally here and vertically here is one unit long, so at least we know so far that the area is less than 1. Since we have 4 rectangles, 1 divided by 4 is 1 fourth. Now we have the width, or base, what's the height, or length? Plug the numbers down here into x squared, and here are the answers. Then multiply the base times height, then add up all the rectangles. And here's your area, although there's a good margin of error, because they don't exactly match the shape. But what if you made the rectangles smaller?
smaller and then did the same thing again what about even smaller or even smaller than that as you do this more and more you start to realize that the rectangles are starting to match the original shape and the area under this curve is starting to get closer to 0.3 repeating in fact that's our answer one third now this seems like a similar technique like we did with derivative that's because it is this is the other most fundamental concept of calculus the integral an integral is the area under a curve function and the technique we use to find the answer is called integration and this is the formula to find it now I know I know this looks scary but it's actually not as bad as it seems all this means is take the rightmost point here which is the upper limit all the way to the leftmost point here which is the lower limit take the base times height of all the rectangles and add them up this long s is the universal sign for an integral the f of x is where our function goes and the dx is the derivative symbol you don't really do anything with this all this acknowledges is that you're cutting the rectangles really 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 small if you draw a straight line on a piece of paper it doesn't really have much shape to it but if you draw a bunch of them in a row in succession then it starts to form a shape it's the same concept with integrals but what if we didn't have a graph to work with what if all we had was the function how do we integrate it then it's actually really really easy remember how we found the derivative of a function to integrate it just do the same thing in reverse whenever you have this you raise the exponent by one and then divide by the new exponent whenever you have a number by itself you just add a variable to it and in calculus it's common to put a plus c after your answer this c means constant which just means any number because remember when we found a derivative of a function if we found a number by itself we got rid of it since we're doing it in reverse we're just acknowledging that so let's try it with our function just raise the exponent by one and then divide by the new exponent and you get one over three times x cubed then you take the number in the upper limit plug it in and find the answer then take the number in the lower limit plug it in and find the answer so one cubed is one and one third times one is one third so zero cubed is zero and one third times zero is zero then you subtract your two answers and voila the area under the curve one third let's try it one more time evaluate this integral remember here you raise the exponent by one and divide by the new exponent here is a number by itself so you just add a variable then plug in the upper and lower limits find the answer and then subtract them boom and it's just that easy by the way if you try finding the derivative of the antiderivative you actually get back your original function because finding the derivative or differentiation is the inverse operation of integrating just like how addition is the opposite of subtraction and multiplication is the opposite of division these operations are two sides of the same coin this is referred to as the fundamental theorem of calculus and it's expressed by this formula by now you already know what most of this means this upper and lower limit next to the line here just refers to your last step of integration where you found your answers after you plugged them into the antiderivative and then subtracted them now we found the area how do we find the volume well let's take our x squared function rotate it around the x-axis until we have a three-dimensional shape kind of looks like a wormhole well we're going to integrate this now we can't divide this into lines but we can divide it into discs see right here is a 2d circle so we'll use that to integrate now what's the area of a circle it's pi r squared so we're just going to integrate pi r squared what's our radius well it's x squared remember whatever the x value here the y value is going to be x squared which in this case is our radius now multiply the exponents pull out pi because it's a constant and now find the antiderivative which is 1 fifth times x plug in 1 it remains 1 fifth plug in 0 it becomes 0 subtract them multiply by pi and your answer is pi over 5 that's the volume of this wormhole looking thing by the way if you were to do this with any 3d object like a sphere and use this disk method to integrate through it if you work through the math taking the formula for the area of the circle plugging in the radius of the sphere and find the antiderivative of that and then plugging the numbers in your answer will be the exact formula for the volume of a sphere now we can find the volume and area for finite shapes but can we find the volumes for shapes that are indefinite infinity is a very important thing in calculus however what you need to know is that infinity is not a number it's a concept if you count one two three and then go on forever you'd be counting to infinity but how many numbers are between one and ten there are actually an infinite amount of numbers between one and ten heck there's even an infinite amount of numbers between one and two what about 1.5 or 1.1 or 1.1000001 or 1.0000002 what about 1.2 and 500,000 zeros follow it ending with a one what about the same number ending with a two and even that can get bigger you see the concept of infinity is more complex than it seems there are different types of infinity and some infinities are bigger than other infinities in fact there are an infinite amount of infinities but no need to stress your brain over it just remember infinity is a concept not a number now on to indefinite shapes there is a well-known shape reference in calculus called Gabriel's horn this is the function for it and its starting point is at x equals 1 and this is what it looks like but we can still find the area using the disk method from before put pi r squared into our integral and replace the radius with the function now our lower limit will be 1 but our upper limit will be infinity now how are we gonna do this once again it's easier than you think like always you pull the pi out find the antiderivative of this and here you get negative 1 over x now just plug in the 1 negative 1 to the negative 1 is just 1 and 1 over 1 is 1 multiplied by pi and the answer is pi now plug the infinity
infinity, what's 1 divided by infinity? It's pretty much 0. So we'll just count it as 0. And pi minus 0 is pi. So the volume of Gabriel's horn is pi. However, if you calculate the surface area of the horn, which also involves integrating, you'll find that the answer that you get is infinity. So you have a shape with a finite volume, but an infinite surface area. That's like being able to completely fill a paint bucket with paint and never having enough paint on planet Earth to paint the outside of it. But that's what calculus is all about, doing something an infinite amount of times and getting a finite answer. By the way, the way I showed you to integrate is not the only way to do it. There are many other rules and techniques to perform integration, and some integrals can get very, very complicated and can even take hours to do by hand. But this was just the basic bare bones of it. So, did you learn anything? If you did, be sure to share this video, and thanks for watching.